It's Mondays with Jay Lehman, our All-American linebacker, and these have been a lot of fun, Jay, and uh, I keep getting people asking me, uh, when is the pod coming out? I need it. I need it with Jay Lehman, especially when you're on a three-game Big Ten West winning streak, a five-game win streak overall, ranked inside the top 20. What is happening here, Jay? Illinois football is really good. We've never had this kind of demand for the podcast, though, at least uh, in, in in the short Maybe I've, you've done a lot more years than I have. So, but it seems that Illinois football is at a fever pitch. Um, I, 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 what I'm excited about is I don't think we've won like this in my memory with dominant domination on both sides of the ball. I think that's what's encouraging when people are like, how good is this team and how good can it be? Cause I think there's hope. And it's just a reminder to me, Jay, I know this is a basketball school, as people like to say, there's nothing like college football Saturdays and what that can do for an athletic department, what that can do for a town. I mean, we've seen it with Alabama once Nick Saban goes there. Um, we, we see it throughout the Big Ten. Like, sure. it's just a different kind of feeling around. Well, town. I think Saturdays in the fall in Big Ten country, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are special, no doubt. Have they been that special the last 10, 15 years, Illinois? Um, no. I mean, we've had some September where we've had some hopium, right? But we we have not had the success with – you said the Nick Saban effect. I think since he got there, or, you know, I, I think Alabama's went from twenty five to 38,000 students or something like that. I have people in my neighborhood that are going to Alabama, like, Alabama, like, why are you – you're going to Alabama because you saw them on TV, right? So I do believe that it is a huge brand piece of the university – and there's just a different energy on campus when your football team and around town, and I think in the state, but you definitely feel it in Champaign, Champaign County, and on campus with this football team, we're winning and there's some success and people are hungry for it, right? We don't have this all the time, so they're really hungry. How hard is it, Jay, to do what Illinois just did during this three-game stretch of sure. – Teams that love to run the football, you know, physical. I mean, Wisconsin, Iowa, yeah. Minnesota, that's what they have established. And, you know, Minnesota's offensive line, I thought, played pretty good against Illinois. But right. uh, how difficult is what they just did? Can you put it into context? Well, I, I think it's it's extremely difficult because you're going against three very physical football teams, right? And you have to be more physical than them. And I would just say, hands down, Illinois, on the offensive line, let's not forget them, and the defensive line, was more physical than Iowa, um, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And, and I don't just take that it's just because they're veterans or seniors. There's a lot of veterans and seniors on a lot of these teams because of the COVID year, right? But to do what they've done through losing a quarterback, having some guys banged up, to go on the road for oh, the first one and then be a team in Iowa that's really had Illinois' number more than any other team, I would say. Uh, in the West has really had Illinois number. I think it's very, very difficult to have that level of consistency. The level of consistency we're seeing from the defense is very, very rare, right? I mean, you'll have defenses play good for a stretch and then a big play goes, right? Um, the defensive level that they're playing at, the way they're winning football games, I, I know I keep saying it, it's special, it's unique. You, you look at the, the defensive stats for sure, but it's the attitude that they play with, right? The swagger they play with. These guys actually believe that they are the best defense in the country, and they're showing that they are. And I will say this. I got to see them in person on Saturday. This team is fast. I don't know if I've seen the defensive backs this fast at the University of Illinois and the defensive linemen and the linebackers, but really just the defensive backs, some of the plays they made highlighted the speed. This is the fastest defense we've seen ever. I want to get into the offense and some of the fun of having the, the individual performances some of those guys have, but you're hitting on a J Minnesota passed the ball, you know, 18 times for 38 yards, zero touchdowns, three interceptions. I know two of those are late with a backup freshman quarterback in, but still, how does Illinois do this time after time since Indiana, right? Since that last Indiana drive, sure. the secondary, the defensive front, like, how are they doing this to passing offenses? So uh, what ends up happening, it, it works together, okay? So Minnesota likes to get ahead of you, just like Wisconsin likes to get a hold of you, ahead of you. 
and kind of squeeze the clock, time of possession, right? And we did the exact same thing in Minnesota. And so they have to kind of play catch up, right? And this is why I, I think we're, and I said it last week on the podcast, we're an excellent second half team. Like, you know, there's the old phrase that, you know, when you're going against a fast receiver, if you're even, he's leaving, right? If we're even at half, chances are we're leaving in the second half. And that's just because we start to wear people down, okay, first and foremost. But I will say this. How do we keep, you know, playing such great pass coverage? I mean, I would say Quan Martin's pick, Kendall Smith's quick pick was amazing. But I would say Quan Martin's technique on that pick, <laughs> if you look at that, one, he's in phase with the receiver. That means he's basically running the route with the receiver, but with inside leverage which is between the quarterback and the receiver. So he's in between the ball, you know, where, where the ball has to go. For him to turn his head around like he did, put a hand up with about a half a second in real time, it looks easier in slow motion, but about a half is a remarkable, remarkable play. So uh, not only are they fast, they have really, really good technique. Um, they play one or two coverages, but they look the same basically uh before the snap and you don't know what it is until it's snapped and so there's cover one there's cover two a little bit of cover three mixed in but for the most part that's it right and what they have is there is an internal clock in the quarterback's uh mind that they got to get the ball out and we've seen this now three games in a row the effectiveness tanner morgan was not effective in the first half at all but i would just say their attitude and the effectiveness of quarterbacks and kind of their moxie gets way, way lower as the game goes. The hits are taking a toll, right? And I hope Tanner Morgan's okay. Don't want to see him go. But the point is, if you look at what Spencer Petras did, you look at what Brendan Armstrong did, look at what Graham Mertz did, they don't play well in the second half. They, they'll start throwing the football to you. I guarantee you Ryan Walters is saying, guys, just wait. In the second half, they're going to start throwing the football to us. Yeah. And they do, right? Because the guys throw him for his life. So it's a combination of getting ahead in the game, relentless pressure up front, Great technique, great speed, and really capitalizing on plays. There's been so many plays over the last decades that I felt like they were there that we didn't make. We make the plays that are there to be made now because we have confidence to make them. Jay, I want to get into um, Gabe Ackes. Like we, we've talked about Seth Coleman, John Newton, Keith Randolph. And we've talked about Gabe, but, but I thought this was one of his stronger games, and, and he had the big sack. But there were a couple, you know, chase downs of, of Tanner Morgan that he had that were really impressive. Even the, the Tanner Morgan touchdown run, I thought he did a phenomenal job cutting off the pass. Uh, sure. It's just the, the Illinois defensive line got, got blocked down. Um, this kid is is playing like a freshman All-American right now. Like he's yeah, I mean, he, he is a freshman All-American. He has the body type for it. Some of his best plays were – one of his best plays was third and ten, and he, and he ran down Tanner Morgan on a scramble for a gain of eight that forced a punt. Yep. Um, that was one of his best plays of the game because it showed relentless effort, right? Um, and he's a unique, unique guy. I mean, I think he's actually taller than he actually looks because he just is so wide too. He's a wide, thick dude. I know they picked him, correct me if I'm wrong, I picked him up out of Florida late a little bit, right? I mean, late late in the game, a coach called Bielema and said, this is the guy, right? Yeah, and then uh, he picked uh, uh, Illinois on signing day over Tennessee. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? They were able to, to get him two good programs, by the way, right? Right now. Um, but I think Gabe Ackes is going to be a star. Um, I think right now, as much as we, and this is something to think about when we think about next year. People always like to look at, oh, who are we losing? Who's not coming back? Carney and Gay were a huge void coming in. We thought, man, is there going to be an outside linebacker to fill? I think Coleman's playing just as good. And I'd say Gabe Ackes is getting to the level he's playing just as good. And so I'm excited because it shows me we're developing talent, right? It's not like we're just coming in and saying, these guys are, are, are Mark Hughes on Gabe Ackes certainly had some fanfare. But remember, he's a true freshman playing against fifth, sixth, sometimes seventh year seniors and making plays. And so I think I can't say enough what Kevin Kane's done with the outside linebackers really got them coached up well. Tommy DeVito returns from injury. We're all wondering if he's going to play. Brett Bielma did a good job of, of being coy about that all week. But Tommy DeVito goes, and and that might have been his best performance, Jay. What, what stood out to you? Well, one thing that's always stood out to me about Tommy is how poised he is. I don't think people realize that 
he really has a good sixth sense in the pocket. Yes. There were times where he, there was pressure and you'll see him not look at the pressure, but keep his eyes downfield and make a throw. Um, I think he's very poised on third and fourth down. I mean, some of these fourth downs, it could be a different ball game in Iowa, in Minnesota, if you don't get some of these fourth downs. Um, so I also think the timing is so much better on the short routes with DeVito than Sitkowski. Uh, Art likes to see things develop a little bit, which the longer routes allow them to do that. But when we talk about RPO game, it's a lot of timing, right? And I will say, I thought Pat Bryant played one of his best games. Um, that fourth down catch where he went behind himself, or maybe it was third down. Yeah. Um, you know, that was, it was not the best ball from DeVito. Pat Bryant bailed him out, right? Yeah. I was, I was really excited too that DeVito went right back to Isaiah Williams. That's very Lunny too, after a tough game. And Isaiah even said, man, I shed some tears over the last game. That's hard to come back. And to play like Isaiah did shows the leader that he is. I like that they they moved him off a of punt. I think he does enough for this team. I think I think Hank Hank Beatty's a good sure hand, sure handed guy back there. Um, but I thought that Devito going to him as well, yeah. you know, early getting him in it. But I, I I can't say about Devito, and it, it does have to do with the protection because I, I I think that's I mean going into the game we were 12th in the nation in sacks given up. Let's not forget that we do run block well. We 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 do, but I think his poise, his decision-making, he takes care of the football. We haven't seen a quarterback play like this since Nathan Shieldhouse. You know, I, 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 arguably, I think he's having a better season throwing the football than Juice Williams had, right? At, we look at an efficiency perspective. He's not quite the runner Juice was, uh, nor is he in a system that makes him run the football. But when we look at just the sheer numbers of taking care of the football, he's very Wisconsin esh of John Stocko, of, of, of Joel Stavi, you know, all those names that we hear about that is very efficient. Man, I got some long answers because I got a lot to talk about. You're just no, waiting for questions. I, I don't gotta ask much. Uh no, his he's on pace, Jay. His current completion rate and current efficiency rate. Now, a lot of that has to do with the system, right? But he's very sure. accurate, as you said. Those would be single season records right now for, for Illinois. So I want to ask you this, Jay, how many quarterbacks would you take in the big 10 before you get to DeVito? I, you know, that's a, that is a really, really good question. You know, I think it's different from what I would have said from the beginning of the season, right? Uh, first of all, he's my first quarterback taken in the big 10 West. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, over O'Connell. Over O'Connell. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, you, said, you acted like that, that wasn't even a, a choice there. I, no, I, think I, mean, it's pretty good. I think O'Connell's part of a system that's really good. Okay. I really do. I think O'Connell is a good football player. I think he's been gifted with some great receivers, but let Tommy DeVito in that system, see what he does. Okay. Mm. I don't think Casey Thompson's much Tanner Morgan. We've had lots of history with Tanner Morgan. We just saw what he did. Graham Mertz, uh, Helensky, I got to see in person, eh, right? So then we go over to the Big Ten, Big Ten uh, East, and I will say this. Uh, I would probably put two or three guys above him. I would put C.J. Stroud. Uh, Talia Tonga-Vailoa, when he's healthy, has a great arm. And then, um, you know, I think I put him tied right there with um, McCarthy, uh, J.J. McCarthy. I think Peyton Thorne in the right system is shown to be good, but I think DeVito's outplaying him this year. So I put him at, at three or four in the conference right now. Um, Aiden O'Connell would be right there by those other guys. I just think he's in a system that really benefits him. I know that might be a, a hot take, right? Uh, maybe because I'm low on Purdue, but that's kind of my take right now. Well, the other week I kind of compared him to Sean Clifford. I think DeVito's playing better than Clifford right now. Yeah, no, I, I, and Sean Clifford's a gutsy dude, right? But, but for what they ask him to do in a system, like because it's all system-based, right? A lot of it is. He executes that system pretty flawlessly for being in it like one year, less, less than a year. Um, C.J. Stroud is obviously, he's the, he's the leader of the pack, but I think you can make arguments for other guys. 
Chase Brown, 44 touches, 235 yards. I, I don't think they want to do that much moving forward. And Josh McCray coming back likely for Nebraska uh, should help them do that. But man, you talk about a workhorse and, and this ain't the biggest guy. This isn't Monty ball, right? This isn't Rashard Mendenhall, who is 225 no. pounds. Uh, he's doing this at 205 pounds and, and there's not much more you can ask out of Chase Brown. Well, he, he's obviously, and Coach Bielma said he's taking care of his body uh, a ton uh, outside of, you know, when we see him. But to take 44 touches at 205 pounds, it's incredible. Um, the way they tried to give him the football in space, I love that. Uh, not only through the passing game early on with the wheel route, but also I, the, the quick pitch out to, to outside has been a great play for Illinois. The counter play, for the most part, as long as the Tyler Newman's not blitzing, is a great play, right? And uh, But I can't say enough about Chase. I think when we saw him come in, you could see the athleticism off the jump, right? But I think you see a really good football player now, like really well-rounded. I mean, as P.J. Flex said in his post-conference, he's the total package. He's got the speed, the durability, enough size to break tackles, right? Slippery. Um, and he's a guy that you can hand the ball off on third and 11 in a critical time in the fourth quarter and think you might get a first down. And he did, right? So you're like, it, I just, from a defensive perspective, that's very difficult, right? But I don't know about you. I watch the game and I always pray in my mind, Chase, just get up. Yep. Get up after that hit. Get up. I think everybody's thinking get up because – as Brett said, there's not a guy in the country that he knows of that does more for his football team than Chase. Yeah, it's it's amazing what what he's doing right now, and he's putting himself in uh, elite territory. He already has, um, but he's he's on pace to break Mikel Shore's single season record. He's on pace to be number two all time uh, at Illinois in rushing. Jay, and he's he's done this so far in 26 games at Illinois. He's number six all time uh, yeah. in rushing. Um, so if we had a Mount Rushmore of Illinois running backs. Is he on it already? Like well, I only, only get four, you know, it's you tough know, to Illinois. Yeah. Here's the, if you look at Grange's numbers, I mean, they're not phenomenal. Right. But I mean, you, it how, has can, to be. how can you leave, leave Grange off? Right. Um, so Grange I, Richard are the two, no doubts. Right. I, I, I mean, I have to go with Richard, you know, I think so. You know, a guy that was really good, but never got the credit was Pierre Thomas. Really yeah. good. He's close, right? But I, I think I think I think you got to put Chase on there. I do. So I think Chase, Chase, Richard, uh, Grange. Now this is where people could could could, could fight me because you got you got Mike you got Mike Kellishore, you got Thomas Rooks. Who'd you say? I'm sorry, Grabowski, Jim Grabowski, J J Grabowski. You got J.C. Caroline. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you've got a lot of football players in there. Thomas Rooks. Um, you know, Robert Holcomb had a ton of yards. I mean, people don't talk about that, but, um, you know, I'll say this. I'll, I'll, I, yeah, I think it, there's got to be something from each generation. So I have Grange, Grabowski, Richard, Chase. I will say I really like Michael. Michael didn't have a ton of games either. Right. He's a cool player, you know, and a different type of runner for sure. Yeah, Howard Griffith, obviously. Like there, there's yeah, so many good ones. Howard Griffith, you know, 31 touchdowns. He's got more TDs than anybody, you know. Um, it's so hard to compare running backs in different eras because they do different things, right. right? I still think the biggest thing, uh, not so much touchdowns, it's yards for me for, for tailbacks because touchdowns can be deceptive, right? I mean, you get the ball at the one. I mean, the refrigerator Perry scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. So it's like – I don't know. I still think it's yards. So Chase is definitely up there. I don't know if I've asked you this question, Jay, about his NFL stock. Cause he's not the biggest guy, right? Like Richard and Mikel were such good prospects because they could run fast and they had 225 Dude. plus pounds sure. on them. I, I have a feeling Belichick's going to get a call from, from his buddy, Brett Bielma. Sure. And that would be a good fit. But uh, what do you think about him as an NFL prospect? Well, I think he's shown he can catch the football. I think that's important. I think he can, he's also shown early on he was not an every down back. They used to take him out for, for pass blocking. So he showed he could do that. Um, I, I think thought this was one of his best games for that, by the way. Yeah. You know, he did a great job. I, I think he could play special teams if you wanted him to. 
you know, I don't think you want him to because he's playing 44, got 44 touches last game. But I, I think his stock has to be going up. And and I see him, I see him actually as as you know, James White caught a lot of passes for um the the Patriots, you know, and that was a Belama guy. But I see him getting up on the draft boards. I don't know if he's quite first round because of size, certainly not because of production, but I could see him going to the second and third round for, for some of his production that he does and what he can do. And he's, he's got, I mean, it comes out, if he runs a four, four, which I think he will at the combine, he could go very high. I agree. If he's, if he's sub four or five, there's, there's no doubt he's getting drafted. Um, yeah, yeah. That's for sure. Um, I, I, I'm glad you shouted out the offensive line, Jay. I think they are playing their best ball right now. Like we thought they could have some growing pains. They did early on. I think Isaiah Adams is maybe the best offensive lineman on this team. Alex Bocheski has been playing so good, but what are you seeing from them up front? Because they're barely letting any pressure. DeVito had all day. And, and when you're running for 200 plus yards against these three teams, they've just played um, that's saying something about these guys. Well, I would say one, they work really good in tandem. Okay. So they work good as a unit. You're only as good as your unit runs. I, I think I, I was been really impressed how they, they, they've been able to pull. We've seen the counter play uh, really pay dividends and that's the guard and tackle pulling around. And so I've been, in, I've been impressed by that. I've even been impressed by Pilstrom holding the point. Mm -hmm. I think he's probably the guy that's overachieved the most out of that offensive line. And I'll be honest, I know that we, you know, I know Adams was supposed to be a decent Juco, a good Juco. Chrysler was supposed to be good. I had no idea what we were going to get. And I think they've done a phenomenal job, phenomenal job of getting them plugged into the system and getting them rolling right away. And what I, what I see, we asked me what I see is unbelievable push. Like we might not get yards every play, but I feel like we very rarely get pushed back. And this is why I think when we look at all this, when we just look at the offensive line and defensive line, we match up with anybody in the Big Ten. I'm talking about anybody. I think Michigan's going to be a tough matchup, but I think, I think Michigan might even be a tougher matchup than Ohio State because of the physicality that Michigan has is the only team I've seen on tape that has the same physicality that we have. I'm not saying Ohio State isn't good. I'm just saying they're not nearly as physical as Michigan and, and Illinois. Again, if we had all white jerseys on everybody, right? Take yep. off the helmets. You tell it, who's the most physical teams? It'd be Illinois and Michigan without a doubt. And I see their offensive line, Michigan's offensive line, do similar things and our ability to climb to the second level. We have the ability. It's one thing to a high school lineman will very rarely be able to block a linebacker, let alone a safety. We have the ability as linemen to really get up on the linebackers. They do a tremendous job of that. Yeah. And they make, they make adjustments. I will say Bart Miller's made adjustments at half to, to open up the running game more sometimes in the second half. So I, I, I do want to mention that as well. What, what are some of those things, Jay? Like, what have you seen? What, like, so early on, I saw that, let's take the Iowa game. They were a lot of times putting three receivers over to one side, okay? And then putting and then running chase back to the other side, and it was the why they were lining up the, the way the way in, uh, Iowa was lining up. It created some holes, right? And then against against um, Wisconsin, uh, you know, they did some things early on to really set the edge against Illinois, right, and made it really difficult. And so what they ended up doing is they ended up hitting that counter. If you don't, if you remember this, not outside. They hit it right up the A and B gap, just kicked that guy out, and it went for 50 yards, right? So, like, little things like that, because, like Palchewski said, if we can get Chase on a safety, it's a good chance he's going to make the guy miss, right? And he's made those guys miss a couple times. And so just those little adjustments, I think also wearing people out, boom, 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 has made a big deal for this football team. And I will just say this as I keep on rambling. I think a lot of it has to, we don't talk about this a lot, but I've heard Brett mention this. I think Illinois is a very unique prep when it comes to playing them in the Big Ten West, where I think a lot of other people are similar preps. You know, I'm playing Iowa, I'm playing Minnesota. Wisconsin's a little different for what they do defensively. When you play Illinois, 
you're going to play a team that really just plays man-to-man aggressive style disguises cover two and they have a they have an offense that's a little bit different I, yeah. I um you know it's a little bit different than iowa wisconsin they have that throw in there right so it's a little bit different prep than just your, your your typical northwestern minnesota iowa i know i know i know that that produce a different prep and so is in Nebraska but we have different preps on both sides of the football which I think makes it unique for us and hard inside the west for people to kind of catch up it's a really good point um and that's kudos to, to Brett Bielman and his staff it's just a really well coached uh team one, one thing they do have to to clean up here Jay if we want to get nitpicky about winning the Big Ten West about competing against Michigan and Ohio State you gotta score touchdowns right sure. you're, you're going up against Purdue sure. Oh, a Michigan and eventually maybe even Ohio state in a big sure. 10 championship game. What have been the issues there that, that you see uh, in the red zone? Because this has been an issue throughout the year. Uh, they're getting to the red zone a lot more, twice more a game than they got last year. So kudos to Barry Lunny for that, but they're actually averaging slightly fewer points per red zone trip at this sure. point uh, than they did last year. So what what's the key there? What are some of the issues? So uh, the, I know people like to hear is I think one of the things is confidence, right? I think they're kind of in their own head a little bit on it. Um, if you look at the tape on Barry Lunny, it's not for lack of creativity in the red zone. So let, let remember, remember Chase Brown had a halfback pass off Pat Bryant's hat, uh, hands in, in Indiana. Uh, they kind of had a little trickeration play where they tried to get Tip Ryman uh, or maybe it was Luke Ford open on this play, right? Yeah. Where they kind of did some different things. They had a direct snap to chase, you know, where it was a good play just to get in the end zone. Um, so it's not for lack of creativity. Let me just say that, right? I mean, they faked a reverse to Isaiah and then they, you know, you got to tackle for loss, right? So I think it's not for lack of creativity, but I will say, um, I will say this, the art, the windows do get very, very tight in there and when you're in the rpo game the windows are already tight i'm just telling you right now and when you're that tight now instead of just having a corner i've got a safety right there as well on that slant route so the slant route's very difficult in the close end zone in 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 what i what we call like the near red zone which is like 10 and m to hit that slant route right a lot of our out routes are like three or four yard outs. And you'll see we're all often getting tackled without any yak. So we're, you know, for your eight, we're getting tackled at the three or four, right? But I think the most confusing thing to me is for as good as the offensive line is, why can't we run the ball more effectively, right? And I don't know why. I thought the quarterback run was a great mix up. I think DeVito has the ability to keep people honest in that. And I think that'll be a point of emphasis in the bye week to really hone in on how do we get touchdowns. Brett even said in his post, in his, I think his halftime talk, field goals don't win games, touchdowns do, Mm -hmm. you know, and they know it's something they got to get better at. Yeah, Jay, I get a lot of people saying, just run the ball, use Chase Brown. It's like, well, they have, (laughs) like they have, uh, it's just the offensive line uh, until they get to the one with those sneaks, it it just hasn't been uh, as easy for them. But that's why Tommy DeVito has been, I think he's really key because he's been their best red zone runner here recently. He's key. And I would say first down success. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that the first down has been a throwaway down for not throw. I shouldn't say throwaway. They've been stymied on first down. And then it seems to get a little bit panicky when that happens. Yeah. All right, Jay, Illinois got has an off week, much needed for chase Brown and probably a lot of those uh, starters Heading into Nebraska, a team that gave Purdue a scare because their offense can score points. What do you think is important during this off week leading into a game where, hey, if you want to win the Big Ten West, you got to you got to keep winning the games you should win, and this yeah. is a game you should win. I think number one, you know, get Chase Brown a hundred percent. I mean, he is a hundred percent, but just get him rested, right? I mean, so much runs through Chase, right? Get Tommy a hundred percent. He certainly looked 100%. I didn't see any kind of hobble or he certainly wasn't inaccurate. He's 25 for 32, right? But I would continue to do this. I would continue to work on the red zone, on the pass game, because we're going to need it. And what do you work on defensively other than let those guys rest? 
and 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 simply you know let the young guys play. I mean, usually by weeks. I mean, I've been part of football teams at Illinois. We installed a whole new defense on the bye week for Penn State that was coming in 2005. And that defense got shredded for like 60 points yep. on ESPN. So the fact that there's not that much to get better at, right, is a good thing. I do think, and I know Brett mentioned that D'Angelo McCray could be back. And I, and I do think, especially with Reggie Love getting banged up. I got to correct you, Josh McCray. D'Angelo McCray is a throwback, man. Four-star D lineman. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yanko was was there for a year and they transferred to Eastern. Josh yeah. McRae. You know, enough names go through your head as an announcer. Sometimes you just have to get I, corrected. I, I wanted I wanted to correct you just because man, do you have a D'Angelo McCray story for me? Love it. Oh yeah, D'Angelo McCray. Well, he was a big guy. Um not sure he was a great fit at Illinois, but you know, he was a big guy. Um, good guy though. Uh, I would say this because because Reggie got banged up. I saw him in a walking boot. You know, Chase Hayden, he's safe, but he's not going to make anybody, you know, miss. So I do think D'Angelo, McC Josh McCray is really going to be key in spotting Chase down the stretch. I don't actually think that McCray will get the reps that he got maybe last year because Chase is having playing such a high level. But there are times we do need a back in there that's a threat to run the football when Chase is out. Because if you look at tendencies right now, Chase is out. The tendency is to pass the football, right? Um, and that's not great as we get into better teams. So breaking that tendency a little bit. Hey, and we talk about goal line or, you know, red zone issues. Maybe Josh McCray can, can certainly uh, <laughs> help with that. All roads lead to November 12th against Purdue, Jay. Illinois, Purdue, uh, is the race for the Big Ten West right now. Purdue has a slightly easier schedule because they don't play Michigan, but they still got Wisconsin and Iowa uh, here coming up. Um, but what what do you think about those two teams down the stretch? How do you think they stack up? Well, uh, I think, first off, I think the matchup of Jeff Brom as an offensive corner versus Ryan Walters is a, is a great matchup. Um, I also say, they, even before Illinois was really playing great defense, they matched up well uh, with Purdue last year. Okay. So I think they've got confidence going into that. Um, I think it's interesting that we're talking about Purdue and Illinois fighting for the Big Ten West cha Championship, but it's 2022 and that's what's happening. But here's the big thing that game's on November 12th. I hope it's cold. I hope it's snowing. I hope it's just horrible weather because Purdue's not built to really play in bad weather. Remember that game they played Illinois in bad weather and Illinois like beat the brakes off of them, right? If Illinois can keep them off of the field like they did Minnesota, it's going to be a very long day for Purdue. Right now, I think the defense is so much better than Purdue's defense. It's not even close. But the offensive explosive plays through the air can keep Purdue in the football game, right? Um, I think Purdue will probably split games between Wisconsin and Iowa. I think they'll lose one. But I think no matter what, it's going to come down to that, right? Because there's going to be a head-to-head -head matchup. They've got to win that Purdue game. I love that it's at home. I love there's a meaningful game in November. I can't remember the last meaningful game in November like this. And so I'm super excited for it. I think that it's uh, it's a great matchup between offense and defense. But I think our offense will show up as well because I think our offense will be able to score points on them. Last one for you, Jay. Uh, I know it's not sellouts, but these crowds have been great, right? Like, what, what did you what did you think of that? Um, just you know, having having the Big Ten tailgate here, but forty five thousand screaming, staying in the game the entire time. The student section has been full all year. Uh, it's just a it's a different vibe, man. It's a totally different vibe. I, here's the deal. I really believe that we have turned a corner as far as fan apathy. I mean, we never I thought, never thought would turn that corner, right? But I give a lot of credit to this football team because they won games. Uh, they were engaged in the game. They were yelling on third down. They were excited. They could feel important moments where like, hey, if we got to stop, this is, they're kind of done. Um, they cheer the defense at the end, which is just exciting to me. You know, it's got to feel good for the kids, but give, give credit to Brett too. You know, I know he, it wasn't his idea to talk to, you know, the crowd, I think that was cool though. I never remember a coach doing that. You know, I think he really gets it. He gets 
what this team means to Champaign, Illinois. And I mean, if you're looking at the Big Ten right now, you know, from a basketball perspective and a football perspective, man, Illinois locked in some some relatively young coaches. I know Brad's not young. Uh, I know Brett's not young, either of them. But I mean, they've definitely got a lot of years left of coaching. So it's like, man, Illinois in good position and, and you got to give your hats off to Josh Whitmore on getting two guys that have really done well. Exciting times, Jay, people looking forward to you every week. We appreciate, it. we will give you the week off uh, next week with the off week, but uh, man, that's going to be a fun late October into November and potentially a 13th and maybe 14th game because Illinois is definitely going bowling. I said, they're going to win 10 games. So I don't mean there there's, there's, you know, a couple games extra we could throw in there. Yeah. Jay Lehman. Thanks, man. Yep. Take care.